Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just give uh, arrivals a chance to settle themselves in before we lock the doors and bolt them, keeping you all inside. Uh, my name is Adrian Monk. I'm Head of Public Engagement here at the Forum. My pleasure to welcome all of you and our co-chairs to this World Economic Forum on Africa 2015, 25th World Economic Forum on Africa. Um, we'll be hearing from each of our co-chairs in just a moment, but just to introduce them, glad to welcome Anthony Jenkins, Group Chief Executive Officer of Barclays, Pumzile Mlambo Nuka, Executive Director of UN Women, Patrice Motsepe, Founder and Executive Chairman of African Rainbow Minerals, Paul Polman, Chief Executive Officer of Unilever, and Sir Michael Rake, Chairman of BT Group. So I'm going to ask each of our co-chairs just to share with us some thoughts about their expectations and hopes for this meeting. Uh, then we'll be able to take some questions. And if you could keep your questions on the meeting and its themes, if you have anything to take up with our co-chairs individually on their own work, there'll be plenty of time in the next two days. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Anthony and ask him to share a few of his thoughts on this year's World Economic Forum on Africa. Anthony. Well, good morning and thank you. It's always exciting to be in Africa. I've been coming here for about a decade now in various different roles that I've had at Barclays. And you're all familiar with the positive story and the optimism about Africa, and I share that optimism. Of course, there are many challenges around things like infrastructure, education, and so on. But the real question that confronts Africa is a question that confronts every part of the globe in a world where we're going to be experiencing structurally lower global GDP growth than that we became used to in the 20 or 30 years before the financial crisis. And the impact of that is that every part of the globe is going to have to compete aggressively and vigorously if it's going to stake its place in the global economy. There are no free rides anymore, and Africa has benefited, of course, from the growth in activity, particularly in Asia, and the commodity-based economies. But as I said, it's going to have to work hard going forward. And there's two areas in particular that are of interest to me and uh, I think are important areas of focus for this meeting. Uh, the first is the promotion of financial inclusion. Uh, by some metrics, over 80% of people in sub-Saharan Africa have no access to the conventional financial systems. And without access to the financial systems, it's very hard for people to build economic stability and security, it's hard for them to start businesses and promote enterprise and growth. And so financial inclusion, which is a matter both for the financial industry, for governments and the third sector, is a critical topic. The second topic in my mind is also the promotion of trade. My customers and clients in the developed world are extremely interested in doing business here in Africa and there are many African companies which are increasingly doing business across the continent and globally. We need to continue to facilitate and promote that trade as a spur for economic growth. So I think we need to go into this meeting uh, with a sense that there is a lot that can be done, uh, but it won't just happen. We're all going to have to work together to create the conditions for Africa to experience and create its full potential. Thank you. Anthony, thank you. Pumzile, can I ask you to share your thoughts, please? Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be home uh, uh, for me. Uh, my expectation and, and interest in this year's World um, Eco Economic Forum is to encourage uh, the 700 and more business leaders who are here to use what I call the power of one, to make change happen for women. We've evaluated what has happened 20 years since we adopted the declaration in Beijing, and we came up with a very mixed picture. Women uh, are out at home working, about 50%, with a modest increase from 40%, but 75% of them are in the informal sector. So they earn low wages, the jobs are unprotected, no minimum wage, so there's sustained poverty there but they are showing resilience and there's an opportunity to work with those women at that level, including access to final inclusion, for them to become significant players and entrepreneurs. And uh, both governments and private sector who are here can support the growth and the involvement of women in the economy because they are part of the missing story 
uh, that could uh, propel Africa's growth. Women are not a charity case. They are solution makers, and we need to position and recognize them as, as such. And as leaders of companies, they can actually make the decisions to take full advantage of the women on the continent. In addition to that, unequal pay, just from a rights uh, angle. The fact that uh, women in Africa earn 30% less than their male counterparts, the global average is 24%, which is also bad. But uh, if every CEO who's here would go back to their companies and just check how much women are paid. Most time when I ask CEOs about that, they actually don't know. They've never checked. And when they check, sometimes they are shocked to, to, to see that. So that is just one thing that most CEOs can do. And of course, the issue of representation of women uh, in decision-making bodies, both in the private and in the public sector, is quite a, an important um, intervention that is, uh, that, is, that is needed. So if I could get some of that uh, significantly moved forward uh, and embraced by the delegates uh, who are here, that, that would be nice. Thank you very much. Patrice, can I turn to you for your overview on this year's meeting? Uh, thank you. I, I, I've just arrived from uh, the giving pledge in the, uh, in the US. But the, the, the three points uh, I, I want to make is that uh, uh, the, the, the world and Africa is, is uh, going through a, a very challenging uh, economic uh, period uh, in Africa, particularly as far as commodities are concerned, the price of commodities. Uh, and it is critically, critically important that uh, we, we recognize the, the need to remain globally competitive in terms of attracting investment both private investment and uh, domestic investment, as well as investment from other parts of the world. I cannot overemphasize it. You know, sometimes uh, we, we, uh, we see good things and, and we assume that the good things will continue, almost like we have a right to expect that the African economy will continue to do well. But that is, that's not correct. Uh, the, if you look at the history of uh, some of the most successful economies in the world, when they cease to be a, a, a competitive and an attractive destination for domestic and foreign investment, the good work in terms of job creation, economic upliftment, economic growth, uh, stalled and in many respects went backwards. So it's, it's, it's critically important. Uh, I, need to emphasize as well in that regard the need to uh, perceptions about corruption in Africa is, is increasing in certain areas. There should be a zero tolerance as far as corruption is concerned, critically important. And, and uh, the last point I want to raise, and, and I hope these are some of the things that will be discussed, uh, xenophobia, uh, South, South Africa in particular. Our future is inextricably intertwined with the future of the continent. We have to be a country that welcomes and creates a, a dispensation that allows all Africans and people from all over the world to do well. The best economies in the world have grown on the back of uh, creating an environment that is, that is tolerant and also accommodating. So. Uh, we have to do a bit of hard talk. There's, in some areas, uh, the uprisings in uh, Burundi, uh, it is important that we recognize the confidence we have in the people, the democracy in the continent. If you have terms of office as a head of state, and, and we are businessmen, but we have a duty to comment on these issues, it doesn't send a good message that you want to change the constitution to extend your term of office. It's, it's, it's not good. And, and of course, you know, these things, uh, we are business people, there are people who are more qualified to comment, but there are times when uh, we are under a duty to comment on, on, we must continue the good work as far as democracy, we must talk about that. Freedom of speech, freedom, all the basic political, socio-political dispensations that have led to the success of many countries in the world. Prudent and responsible macro and micro fiscal regulatory environments and good work has been done, stay the course.
So I hope those things will be discussed. And, and of course, all of my friends here, what you were saying and others, it's not what the politicians say about investment in Africa. It's what the, the investors say. They make the decisions. And we've got to make sure that they view us as a good place. That's the only way we can create jobs, have inclusive growth, because at the end of the day, we cannot grow if the middle class is not growing. If there's no, we reduce poverty, create jobs, and create a future for all our, all our people on the continent. Over to you. It's hard to follow, <laughs> but I uh, certainly agree we need the good governance. The, um, I'll go back to the theme for one second and not try, try to duplicate the comments made by the, the previous speakers, but the theme of the uh, conference then and now reimagining Africa's future is a very important theme. And if you look, uh, the first thing we did this morning is look at the people that are actually here together, despite an enormously busy global agenda with many people running around trying to do many things. We have a record number of young people here, a record number of women, a record number of business partners that are present here at the WEF and uh, about 700 uh, business leaders, and we equally have a, a significant amount of people representing the different governments that's, uh, from this part of the region. So being together for two or three days, don't underestimate the power of having these people meet and talk, exchange ideas, create new projects and concepts to drive things forward. Africa has done well. The continent has grown consistently for about 5%, and frankly, it needs to grow to the 5, 6, 7% if we really want to get where Pumsili is, give everybody a chance and develop everybody. And so, so the growth is actually, to some extent, encouraging compared to the rest of the world, but it is below what we need if we want to lift the people out of poverty. Especially in this part of the world, you still see a significant gap between the Millennium Development Goals and what we need to achieve. So only economic development can achieve that. And increasingly, that economic development is not coming anymore from overseas development aid. The European markets and the US don't have that money anymore. It has to come, as, as Patrice is saying, from the private sector. So you have to create the environments for the private sector to be able to b do better. In the developed, m developing markets alone, the private sector is about 60% of the economy. It's about 80% of the financial flows now. And it's 90% of the job creation. So if that security, that clarity isn't there, then obviously things will not happen as fast as they should. And it's not the business that suffers, frankly, although we make the point for business, it's the poor people that suffer. Just let's be very clear what we're talking here. There are three uh, topics or focus areas on the web which are already addressed by Patrice Pomsilli and Anthony, which is the first one is marshalling resources. If you want to do anything, we have to get the right resources behind that. And the resources that are being talked here are around energy, are around infrastructure, are around uh, the financial resources that Anthony talked about, but most importantly, the human capital. We have to create more leaders, leaders like Patrice coming from this region or Pomsilli, that actually take charge of a lot of the things that need to happen. It should not come from outside of the region, it should be from inside of the region. We have to talk about enabling markets. If these markets are not enabling, uh, food security is a great issue, but the markets often don't function. The financial markets, the trade zones, how do we make them work? The more efficient these markets function, the better we can create the environment for business to, sp uh, to prosper. And then last but not least, obviously, we have to inspire the creativity. Being here in South Africa, I'm reminded of Elon Musk and his enormous creativity, but he does it in California. You know, this country has more, this continent has more young entrepreneurs than any other continent in the world. So how do we harness that and create the future for many of the things that are coming, from green technology to obviously uh, the information aids that uh, Michael Dowdley will talk about? This continent has a lot of potential to lead on innovation. We, um, we, we see this as a very crucial year, and we see this as a very important meeting, because this is the year that we have the Finance for Development conference in Addis Ababa in July. We have the sustainable development goals that we all need to agree on in uh, September in New York. And we have the COP21, which is the climate change negotiations in December in Paris. And not surprisingly, all of them are related and they're all about the development agenda. Uh, the climate change is affecting the poor. There's no development if we don't attack climate change. So the goals, the sustainable development goals, the word S, the S from sustainable, is a very important part of that. And the financing for development is the mechanisms, hopefully, that can unlock some of these things. 
And what we find increasingly is as this continent grows as well, it is actually the biggest risk to its growth is climate change. This continent will be more subject to the effects of climate change, despite being a low carbon <coughs> emitter, than any other continent in the world. And it will put people back at a faster rate than people start to realize. Simply because we are at a point in the world, if we like it or not, that the cost of not acting is becoming higher than the cost of acting. So one of the most important things that we need to do is to have a clear discussion with the facts about the fact that you can only get healthy growth if you also attack the issues of climate change. There is no compromise anymore. We will be launching the Africa Progress Report, which was sponsored by Kofi Annan, and we'll talk about what is needed to keep Africa growing, whilst also be climate smart. We're talking about agriculture, the Grow Africa <coughs> Initiative, or the Tropical Forest Alliance, dealing with these issues of sustainable agriculture, dealing with these issues of preventing deforestation. Just the food sector alone, the deforestation basically driven by the demand of food, the food sector alone is about one-third uh, one of the global warming. And we have to be sure that in Africa we don't import the bad practices from the Far East. Because as the Spanish would say, the Spanish have an expression that says, pan por hoy, hambre por mañana. You might think you have bread today, but you're starving tomorrow. So if we don't do this properly, we obviously don't get there. And then the final thing that we will be focusing on is we've learned an enormous amount from the Ebola crisis. On the positive side and on the negative side, 11,000 innocent people lost their lives, 27,000 cases. Many of the health workers that went there were absolutely heroes because more of them lost their lives than in any other crisis in the world where they volunteered themselves to be there. So you talk about leaders. You, you have some there that are enormous. But we have to learn because it was a pretty cha chaotic response. It was very late. It was uncoordinated. And it affected the business community as well. If you take my premise that we see a more volatile, uncertain world, we see more effects of climate change, political instabilities, uh, natural disasters, pandemics because of a global interdependent world, we need to come to grips with a better emergency disaster system. And as Pumsili rightfully says, it always boils back to the youth and to women as the first thing you need to focus on. Probably the highest return and the best investment. So the fourth part we will be spending time on in the two days here is, is to rally the young that are here uh, and rally the young about around some of these major activities. When we started to develop the sustainable development goals, and I had the honor to be part of the high-level panel at the request of the Secretary General. The, the, the main response we got was from young people in Africa. They, they understand, which, by the way, is half of your population. Paul, I'm going to jump in on you for a moment. And these, uh, these, I'm done. And these people understand that they are not only uh, half today, they are 100% tomorrow. And they want to actively help shape that future. And that is what we will be talking here as the last point. Over to Mike. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. And, and I'll be, most of this thing has been covered. I've been coming here since the late 70s. Uh, and it's great to be here. And I've watched during those years the advance of Africa, the challenges of Africa, and the huge opportunities of Africa that have been discussed on resources, on demographics, and the challenges that remain on the spread of democracy, corruption, and so on. And, and I guess that's why I'm very much here as chairman of BT, because what we do here is to look after and run networks for global companies who are increasingly looking to Africa to invest, and African companies looking to invest regionally and across the world. And it's critical we do that, because one of the challenges is infrastructure. It's critical to a lot of things that have been said about climate change, about education, there are clearly, you know, uh, you know, really top topographic issues around spreading infrastructure. There are regulatory issues about having the right levels of telecommunications. So I'm here to listen and learn around these issues and these developments, which I think are so critical for this continent and what it can do. And last but not least, I'd mention the other thing I think is very important is intra-African trade. Um, and I think the upcoming tripartite FTA on the 10th of June is critically important to reducing barriers to trade right across the continent, which would be a huge impetus to the investment countries that you talked about. Michael, thank you very much. Thanks to all our co-chairs. Uh, we have to have a hard finish at 11, at 10.45. Uh, so can I just get a sense in the room of who has a question, if you could raise your hand, uh, and we'll get a microphone to you. And if you could tell us uh, your name and your organization when you put your question. So a lady in the front and then a uh, lady behind. Yes, good morning, Linda Ensor from Business Day. Um, I'd just like to get some comments on how African growth can be um, taken to the next stage, industrialization and moving away from pure com commodity um, growth, commodity-led growth, which doesn't lead anywhere. If you could 
probably con uh, if you could possibly comment on that. Thank you. Sure. And can I just take that question too. Okay. So who wants to come in on commodity on getting away from commodity-led growth? I can see. Well, no, it's very important. You cannot just uh, dig holes here and ship it out to other countries to then consume it, and it's sometimes even import it again at a very high price. You know, it's ridiculous. We are in the tea business. It's ridiculous to have the big tea plantations here to ship out tea and then have Africans pay an enormous amount of money to buy back the tea bags <laughs> that come in from Europe or somewhere else. So we all understand that. So the most important thing is to develop these markets, first of all, because if these markets have a critical mass, you can also go to the added value. You take South Africa, for example, which is more developed. Uh, Unilever is a very, very big business here. We make 95% of our products are, are, uh, are developed here, and they're also produced here, but also the raw materials are made here. So you create that ecosystem when these markets develop. Uh, infrastructure is a big issue for that. If you, pro for example, sell products in Nigeria, it's cheaper to have it come in from Vietnam nowadays than have it come in from Ghana next door. And so you have to make these markets function here to be very efficient, otherwise you, you have a bottomless pit. So we're working on that in terms of energy, which is a very important thing. In terms of infrastructure is a very important thing. And what uh, has been said before is you have to be sure that these markets function. So governance is a very important part as well. So that if you make these plans that you're not having the setbacks because of the rules, laws, or regulations, or sometimes absence of that. So if we focus on these basic drivers, which are not different than any development drivers, I think you'll also see the manufacturing sector, which is absolutely crucial. But next to the manufacturing sector, I just want to make one sentence is, uh, don't forget agriculture. Africa is going from 1 billion, or 1.3 billion people to 2 billion people. If we don't bring, and the average age of a farmer is 57 years in Africa now, if we don't bring the people back to smallholder farming and this continent to feeding itself, we're not going to solve the enormous issues that this continent has of youth unemployment, which are over 50%. So it's value-added production, but the answer is not only there, it's also in some of the other areas like agriculture. Yeah, I mean, just very quick, quickly, uh, we are not saying mining is not important, commodities is not important. The export of oil, the export of minerals will, for many, many decades, continue to be a critical part of the growth of, of uh, the African economy or the African economies. Uh, the, the, the emphasis is on diversification. Uh, and. and uh, you know, we, we've had for many years, not just in South Africa, but in many parts of the continent, <clears throat> spoken about beneficiation. And, and, and I think part of the secret in relation to beneficiation is you, you've got to make it attractive, profitable to the private sector. It'll take off. And you, you may have to look at uh, mechanisms like uh, tax concessions. I mean, look at, if you see the most successful economies in the world, they have used various measures and instruments. You will not have to worry about beneficiation if, uh, if it makes commercial sense. But it can only happen when we do these things in partnerships with the governments and, and the private sector. But commodities will continue to be very, very important. You also have to match the skills yep. uh, with the needs of the economy, because I think we are also losing the plot because we're continuing to produce the people that uh, are not going to be the drivers of industrialization. So, and that needs the discipline of both training institutions and uh, our and, and policies that drive uh, drive our people to to industrialization. Anthony, do you want to come in? Yeah, I completely support the the education and skills point. I think particularly around the higher value added industries, engineering, high tech, those types of things, which are perfectly viable for Africa to develop vibrant segments in those areas. And the other thing I would say is entrepreneurship is very important. It is a skill, it can be taught. And in many ways, um, as Paul said, this is a continent of entrepreneurs, but we need to give them the skills not only to get started, but also to scale up. So skilling would be a big part of the agenda. Michael from the technology. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's all been said. I think it's absolutely critical with this continent, with this huge population, very high levels of youth unemployment has been said to attract investment with the right infrastructure, right regulatory, democratic, democratic environment. And the key that I would add more than anything else is on education and skills so the workforce is available to fulfill the needs as investment comes in, which also deals with the social problem of youth unemployment. And technology has a key part to play in that. Thanks to all of our 
co-chairs. Um, I wish you all a successful meeting and uh, look forward to seeing more of you in the next two days. Thanks to everyone. Bye-bye.